are fully aware of what's going on. So God pinned this word in my heart last week and uh, these scriptures, and I kind of laid the scriptures over to the side and, and God gave me a thought and he told me last week to begin to minister to you about guarding against deception in your life. And so uh, when I left here on Sunday, God said, you're not done yet. So this lesson is going to kind of piggyback on what we talked about last Sunday. We talked about deception, but this is going to go a little bit deeper, helping us to open up our eyes so that we can see what is going on now in the earth. Amen. So let's pray and ask his glory to just come in. Huh? Father, we bless you. We honor you today. You're such a mighty good God. Father, we ask that you would come into this room. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. We ask you to minister to us. Father, only you can take one word and divide it hundreds and thousands of ways to meet the need of the hearers. Lord, we declare that your word will fall up on good ground as the seed is sown into the earth. God, we pray that it will germinate in our heart and it will produce transformation. God, that your word is life-changing. God, we pray today that the scales come off of our eyes, that deaf ears are open. Holy Spirit, help me to articulate this word in such a way that it will transform us. Not only will it transform us, God, but you will get the glory and you will get the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. As we look around the world today, it is hard to ignore the signs of the time. Uncertainty, moral decay, and challenges are all around us. As a matter of fact, they are on the rise. But in the midst of difficult times, it is becoming increasingly vital for us to ask ourselves, are we spiritually prepared? I need you to ask yourself this morning, are you spiritually prepared for perilous times? In the book of 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul provided us with some timely wisdom and guidance to navigate through such turbulent times. Specifically in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul paints a vivid picture of the characteristics and the attitudes that will mark the last days. I believe it is a sobering reminder that we are living in a time that requires us to be spiritually prepared. So today I want to explore the relevancy of 2 Timothy chapter 1, starting at the, the first verse. I'm going to read a lengthy scripture today, but I believe that we're going to discover some valuable insight on how we can be spiritually equipped to face the challenges of today. And my prayer for you this morning is that you would open up and receive God's word and let his transformative truth literally transform your life so that we can walk faithfully before God and we can be spiritually prepared for what's ahead of us. So Paul wrote a letter to Timothy. And he says this, so turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and let's start at the very first verse. And it says, I'll be reading out the ESV today, but it says, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulties. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money. They'll be proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. Lovers of pleasure 
rather than God. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Timothy, I mean, Paul told Timothy this, he says, avoid such people. <laughs> Verse six, from among them are those who creep into households, capturing weak women, burdened with sin and led astray about by various passions always learning, but never arriving to the knowledge of the truth. He says, always learning, learning, but never arriving to the knowledge of truth. Just as Jamus and Jamri oppose Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men corrupted in mind, disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not go very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was, thou, as was that of those two men. But Paul said this, but however, you however have followed my teaching my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, and my steadfastness. Paul says, you've seen my persecution, my suffering that happened to me in Antioch, in, in Antioch, in Iconia, and Lister. He says, which persecution I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Paul had a deep conversation, right? <laughs> he says, indeed, all who desires to live godly, a godly life in Christ Jesus, will suffer persecution. You need to pin that in your Bible. He says, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. He says it's going to happen. We talked about that last Sunday. They're going to go on being imposters. Uh, they're going to get from bad to worse. They're going to deceive and even being deceived. But he says this. He says, but Timothy, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it. Paul say, listen, you had a good teacher. And how from your childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Then he says, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man, let me inside, put there, and the woman of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So in other words, Paul was having a conversation. He wrote a letter to Timothy. He says, Timothy, I need you to be aware of the times that you are living in. When I read this passage, I say, it sounds like 2023. It, it sounds like some characteristics and some attitudes that we are seeing today. So he was equipping Timothy. He says, in other words, what I need need you to be is to be prepared for what is to come. So you have to ask yourself a question this morning. Am I prepared spiritually? Now we prepare for everything else. You might be prepared financially if the stock market crashed. You might even have a storehouse in your house and says, listen, if they buy all of the food up, I have a storehouse, I have a supply because I've been storing up over these last few years. You might be prepared for that. 
You might be preparing yourself emotionally for the things that are coming at you. But are you prepared spiritually? to handle the attacks of the enemy are you prepared spiritually to be able to defeat the enemy's thoughts and defeat all of his tactics that he will use against you are you prepared to live in these last days so I believe that we can at least gain three essential points of spiritual preparedness from the text. The first thing I believe Paul was saying, Timothy, you got to recognize the signs of the time. Now, Paul vividly described the characteristics of the last day. He was warning us about the challenging times that we are about to face. As a matter of fact, I will say today, we're right in the damp, in the midst of it. He was getting ready. He says, listen, I need you to be prepared. So in other words, it is crucial for us to be aware of the signs and the manifestations that we are seeing in the earth right now. When you look upon the earth, uh, terracotta, when you look and you see just in nature itself, uh, we see nature moaning and groaning. We see earthquakes over here. There's an earthquake over there. We see all kinds of calamities that are happening in nature. We see tornadoes. We see all kinds of stuff. We see wildfires fires coming up all over the country and all over the world. So so what he's saying is you got to be aware. Your eyes got to be open to see what's happening right now. So what he's saying that we are witnessing some moral uh, decay, erosion in the earth. There's a rise of selfishness uh, and those that are pursuing other things rather than God. But what he was telling us, you cannot just put your head in the sand and act like ain't nothing going on around you. You've seen all of the moral decay, the erosion that is happening in our country, in our nation, all around us. You can look all over the world. You can't just be there like a sitting duck and not look and being aware of what's going on around you. What he is saying that it's important for us to recognize the signs so that we can avoid being caught off guard. If we recognize the signs, not only will we not be caught off guard, but we'll have the wisdom of God to, and the discernment of God to be able to deal with the circumstances and the situations that will come our way. Paul mentioned some characteristics and one of the things he mentioned in the passage is that people will become lovers of themselves. See, if you look in society today, you can recognize the emphasis on self-centeredness, self-promotion, selfish ambition, the pursuit of personal gain. You see it everywhere, everywhere you turn your eyes. We see the pursuit of personal gain and gratification can be overshadowed when we focus on selflessness of humility, sacrificial love. See, all of that can be overshadowed when we focus on ourselves. See, it is hard to be selfless if you always focus on you. <laughs> If it's all about you, it's hard. You know, it's about me. It's about me. It's, it, it, it's, it's hard for you to be selfless. It's hard for you to show sacrificial love. If it's always all about me. 
It's about what I want to do, what I want to achieve, what I want to, uh, I want to have in my life. It's about self-promotion. You see it every day. Those of you that are on Instagram and Facebook, you see it all the time. You see self-promotion. We're promoting ourselves day in and day out. Now, you know, there's some balance to it. I believe that you can promote your job. You can promote the things that is going on in your life. You can promote your business. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is when we're just promoting self and you're saying, world, look at me. We're saying, world, look at me. Look at, look at what I have. Look at what I have accomplished. So what you have to do is ask yourself, what is the motivation by behind me promoting me? See, the last time I heard the word says, Jesus said this. He says, if I be lifted up. He says, I'll draw them unto me. And so we bought, we have to be a, about the business of the father of lifting him up in the earth. And, and we, we decrease, but lift him up so men and women can be drawn to Christ. That's important. See, a selfless person is not concerned about just themselves, but they're more concerned with meeting the needs of others and the wishes of others. They are unselfish. Then Paul happened to mention another attitude. He says in the passage, he warned us there will be people that will be lovers of money. And that's where we get greed and materialism from. And we see in this contemporary culture, after we, it promotes materialism. It promotes con uh, consumerism. It promotes it. it. It promotes us accumulating wealth as the ultimate goal. See, God has no problem with you being wealthy. He has no problem with you being having all of your needs met. He has no problem with you having the abundance, but the problem is with when money has you. When that's all you can think about, uh, when you make it a priority in your life and he's not first place in your life. Because see, when he gives us wealth and he gives us prosperity, God literally fumbles that thing through our hand. He says, listen, it's not for you to just heap it up on yourself and tell the world, this is what I have. He says, no, I give it to you so that you can be a blessing. If you are blessed financially, God wants you to be a blessing to the the world to those that are around you. He don't mind you having nice cars. He didn't mind you having nice houses. But in other words, he said, don't be greedy. Don't let greed capture your heart. Where grief will allow you to do things that you know that is contrary to the word of God. Greed will cause you to make decisions uh, that is not, that will not line up with the truth of the word of God. He said they're going to be those that were lovers of money. Then he came and Paul said this is going to be people that like self-control. And it's very obvious what we see today. We see addictive behaviors all around us. Those that are indulging in instant gratification, a lack of discipline in their life. So there's a life, a, a lack of self-control. And when, I, when, when you have a lack of self-control in your life, it is going to manifest in, in things like substance abuse. We have a lack of self-control with the use of technology today. And even in an unhealthy lifestyle, 
When I think about technology, we have it in the palm of our hands right now. And we have to be so careful that we don't get so stuck in the phone. We have to be so careful, guys, that we don't see our phones as people. We have to be so careful, guys, with the instruments and the technology that we have, that we're not sinking down a dark hole, that we're not going in a dark pathway, because there are things that will pop up on your social media. There's things that will pop up on Google. There's things that will pop up up on your phone and you're going to be tempted to click it. You're going to be tempted to click it and say, you know what? Well, let me see what they're talking about. See, I talked about last week about deception. It's subtle. So it, it's, I, I can bait you. There, there is a lure that's out there. The enemy will drag you in. And so we have to be careful that we don't have walking in a like of self-control. See, when you see, so in other words, what uh, Paul was saying to Timothy, when you see these behaviors, recognize that you're living in the last day. So we look in this passage and we also see people that are disrespectful to authority. You know, now we have people question authority, challenging authority, uh, the authority figures. We see it in the home. Children are challenging the authority of the parent. They're challenging the authority of the teacher. We're challenging the political system. We're challenging uh, those that are uh, police officers. But when we challenge authority, Authority, and we let it get out of control. Now, there is a balance. Yes, I'm saying yeah, there is a balance. There's sometimes when you need to challenge it, but I'm talking about an attitude. It's like, you can't tell me nothing. You can't give me no advice. I'm going to do what I want to do. When you have that type of attitude that you're going to do what you want to do, that you're not going to obey any laws in the land, any authority, then we're going to have some lawlessness in the land. See, you don't want to live in a land with some lawlessness where everybody is their own police. You think you might want to live that way, but I'm here to tell you, you don't want to live like that when they can come in your house and take your stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. That's not the way you want. So he's saying that we're, they're going to be abusive of authority. Then we have those that are going to be deceived and then they're going to be involved in all of the false teachings. And it's important that now, and even especially now, because we are bombarded with a, pl- a plethora of ideologies, I meant to say that word right, of ideologies and belief systems that is bombarding our minds. Day in and day out, right? So it is essential for us as believers to to be able to have some discernment. Why? You need some discernment so you can discern truth from a lie. You need some discernment so you'll know what God's word has to say. So that you can uh, avoid being swayed by deception and making wrong decisions and wrong choices in your life. It's essential. But when we look at it as believers, you ought to not be afraid. You ought to not be surprised by what's going on. But your goal is to be prepared. It is to be prepared for whatever is next. It is to be prepared. You got to be spiritually, spiritually ready for what's happening in the earth. And it tells us number two, it says anchor yourself in God's word. If we're going to be spiritually prepared, we got to get anchored in God's word. Paul told Timothy this. He says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe and knowing from whom you have learned it. He says, listen, Timothy, you've already been a student of God's word. You know, you've been acquainted with the sacred doctrine. 
doctrines uh, and the uh, writings. So you know what God's word says. So it's important that you stick to it. So what was he saying? He said, uh, he was saying that it's important that you ground yourself in the word of God. And today, if you ever want to read the word, you need to read it now. We can no longer be passive about reading the word of God. It's not enough to show up on Sunday and just read a few scriptures and say, I have the word for the rest of the week. No, you got to get in the book. You got to submerge yourself in God's word. You got to know it from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation. You need to know the truth of God's word in your life. Because God's word is a compass for us. It guides us through the storms of life. When you don't know what to do, you can always go to the word of God. God's scripture is a compass. It guides us. It gives us a wisdom. It brings correction and inspiration in our life. When we're down and we're out, we get into the word of God and we understand that we are overcomers. We understand by the word of our testimony. We understand that we're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. We understand that we're not a defeated foe. When we get in God's word, we are made strong in him. We learned that trouble don't last always. Weeping may endure it for night, but joy gonna come in, in the morning. We know we might be weeping right now. We might be crying right now, but joy is coming if we stand still and watch God begin to move on our behalf. What is he saying? You got to get anchored in this thing. You got to submerge yourself in the scripture so that you can stand firm and stand firm in the faith. We said last week so that you won't be tossed to and fro by every wind and every doctrine. You got to know God's word like you know everything else. I want to challenge you this morning as you spend time in Facebook and Instagram. Why don't you see how how much time see how much time you've landed there see how much time you've anchored right there I guarantee you it's more time than you think <laughs> And begin to challenge yourself to say, listen, just as much time that I stay in Facebook and Instagram, I'm going to get back and I'm going to get in the word of God. If I spend 15 minutes there, I'm going to spend 15 minutes in the word of God. If I spend an hour there, I'm going to get into the living word of God so I can hear what God has to say for my life. Trust me, you're going to need it in this hour. You're going to need God's word to be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding. You're going to need God's word in your life. Not only we need God's word in our life, and we need to be anchored in it. Number three, embrace the power of scripture. We got to learn how to embrace scripture's power. And, and Paul said it like this. He was, he reminded Timothy, he says, all scripture is God breathed. It is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correction and training in righteousness. What was he saying? God's word has the power to transform you. It has a transformative power to change your life. It is God's word that brings conviction in us. It is God's word that will give us instruction and it will equip us to do good works. It is God's word that will challenge us day in and day out. 
See, when the men and women of God stands to preach to you, hopefully they are preaching to you God's words, not their thoughts, but God's word. Why? So when you leave this place, you have something that you can stand on. You have something, God, that you can trust in. You have something that will lead and guide you and give you some instructions in your life. It is imperative that we have God's word in our life. It's it's imperative we understand that his word has power. When we embrace the powers of scripture, we open ourselves up for guidance from God. We allow him to mold us and to make us into the image of God. See, you don't know how to live apart from the word of God. See, we were born in sin, shaped in uniquity. So what he's saying is that you have a sin nature. So that comes automatically. You have some sin DNA in you. And the only way to change that is to allow God's word to correct us, to prove us, to rebuke us, to teach us, to train us in righteousness. Amen. And as we do that, we become more and more like him. That's the challenge. That's the challenge. And the challenge is to be obedient to what God's word says. See, we don't want to just be hearers of the word. But we need to be what? Doers of God's word. Amen. In other words, let embrace God's word. Let it transform your life. It's for your betterment. It's for your good. It's for you to be cultivated in the image of Christ. You need God's word. So not only do we need to embrace the powers of scripture, but we need to develop a godly lifestyle. That is crucial. I don't know how many people that walk around and say, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Everybody say that they're a Christian to the point it don't mean anything anymore. Because we can't, we don't know what a Christian is from an unchristian anymore. Everybody is claiming the title. I am a Christian. When we get awards, we stand and say, I'm a Christian. And you know you have not been serving God. So that's why it is important that we develop a godly lifestyle. Paul told Timothy, he says, listen, those that live for God will most likely suffer some type of persecution. In other words, he was saying you're going to have some kind of opposition in your life. And Paul knew best because Paul experienced a whole lot of things in his life. He had experienced shipwrecked. He had been kidnapped, beaten, threatened, arrested, ridiculed investigating and the list goes on and on. So he was telling him, he says, listen, Timothy, you're going to suffer some persecution. In other words, he says, if you come over to the Lord's side and you give him all that you got and you love the Lord thou God with all of your heart, all of your strength and all of your might, don't expect not to suffer some type of persecution. Don't expect for somebody to push back and say, I don't know about that God thing that's going on in your life. Don't expect. He says, listen, because it's going to happen. Be aware. Be aware. Be aware that it will happen in your life. And listen, we don't need to be intimidated about the things that the enemy will bring our way. But understand your authority. Understand your assignment that God has for your life. And then we got to live in a godly lifestyle. We got to persevere, saints. We can't just give up. But you got to persevere. You got to be a witness for God in the earth. You got to exemplify Christ's love, his grace, his mercy, his truth. You got to be a godly example. When you face adversity in your life, you got to do it God's way and not your way. Oftentimes when adversity comes in our life, 
And I know that we're on all levels of maturity in Christ. But a lot of times we like to revert back to our own nature. But what God says, let my word transform you. Let your reaction be seasoned with love. Let your reaction be seasoned with grace. Let it be seasoned with truth. In other words, be God's example in the earth so that he can be glorified. Your suffering that you're going through right now is not going to be in vain. God's going to be glorified through it. They may talk about you but keep on living holy oh they might prejudge you but keep on living holy keep on walking in a loving lifestyle that exemplify the grace and the mercies of God in your life here's the last one but not least equip yourselves for every good work what was Paul saying to Timothy? He says the scripture will equip the people of God for every good work. See, we are in the last days and we are on team Christ. We're not on team world. We're on team Christ. The Bible talks about perilous times, uh, times of difficulties. We are in the last day. So what God is expecting for us, uh, he is calling us uh, to participate uh, in God's kingdom agenda. He says, listen, you are a part of my team. Uh, and because you are part of this team, I expect for you to do something. I expect for you not to just fumble the ball, but I expect for you to throw the ball and run this thing out. Uh, I expect for you to run it to win. I expect you to keep on doing what I want you to do in your life so that you can glorify God. We got to be on the kingdom agenda, not just your agenda, but on God's agenda. What is God saying to us? He wants us to be his ambassador. We are tasked with demonstrating God's love and his compassion to a, a hurting world. See, whether you believe it or not, some of us are intimidated about giving our testimony and sharing our, our faith with other people. There are people that are out there right now. They are desperate for hope. They are desperate for hope. And except we rise up and be the light and not be intimidated about what the enemy will try to throw our way. Except we open our mouths and to begin to tell of the goodness of God, the grace of God, the love and the compassion of God. Listen, we are his feet. We are his instruments. We are his hand in the earth so that we are to show forth his glory. We're to show forth his glory in this hour. You know, I grew up in the church as a young kid, and they've been talking about revival for years. They've been talking about revival. The saints have been anticipating a revival. We have been anticipating the move of God's spirit to just show up and do what he does. We are, some of us are still waiting for his glory. Some of us are still waiting for revival to hit our cities and to hit our land. As I begin to think about it, God said, if my people who are called by my name, if they will humble themselves. Uh, and he says, if y'all will just turn from your wicked ways. Uh, he says, then you go hear from heaven and I'll begin to hear the land. But then I heard God said, if my people, if they will just participate in my plan, if they stop worrying about self, if they stop worrying about their issues and the problems that's going on in their life, they and watch me work on their behalf. If you would just say today, God, here am I. Send me. I'll go. I'll open up my mouth in spite of what they think about me. If you decide today, I guarantee you revival will come to your house. It'll come to your house. All of the dead stuff in your house that need to be resurrected, God will cause it to come alive again. But we just have to participate with God. Church, there's a dying world out there that is hopeless. And they need to know that God loves them. That God cares for them. 
Don't go out there and judge him, but take him the love of Jesus Christ. Give him the love that God has extended to you. Decide, make a decision today that I'm on team Christ's side. Yes, we're living in a world full of trouble, desperate people, perilous times. We're living it out today. It's not coming to us next week, it's today. But however, the scriptures remind us that we gotta be vigilant. We gotta have some discernment. We gotta be spiritually prepared, church. We gotta be spiritually prepared for what's ahead of us so that we can stand in faith in the midst of temptation, in the midst of the pressure that the world put up on us. We can stand and we can stand firm. See, as believers, we have the privilege and the responsibility to be spiritually prepared. And it's important that you recognize the signs. Be anchored in God's word. Embrace the scripture's power and live a godly lifestyle that will begin to show forth his glory in the earth. And I believe without a shadow of a doubt that God is going to navigate us through the challenges that we may face. But we'll have the opportunity to face them in courage, <laughs> unwavering, with the strength of the Lord on our side. We can trust him as we go deeper and deeper and spiritually preparing ourselves to get ready for what God is about to do. He might be ready to use you as a beacon light right where you are. See, we're looking for revival to happen in the church, but baby, the revival can start at your school campus. It can start on your campus. All they need is one fire to be lit <laughs> and let you be the beacon of the light. It can start on your job. His power is not limited. His power is limitless. God is able to go everywhere at all times, in all seasons in our life. So we have to be spiritually prepared. That is the call that God has given to us today. To rise up. Be prepared for what's ahead. So that you're not deceived. In this time. The Bible says that they're going to be in the last days. They're going to be false prophets are going to rise up. False teachings is going to rise up. You know. It's on the rise right now. But you got to be spiritually aware. Not just awareness, but prepared. Come on, stand to your feet this morning. I know this is a challenging word to challenge us to go deeper. I hear what God's saying, get off the surface level and begin to go deep. Get off the surface level and stop worrying about what people have to say about you. Stop worrying about the opinions of men. But you need to be more worried about the opinions of God. Because in the end, he's the only one. I need you to hear me. He is the only one that you're going to have to stand before. He's the only one you got to be accountable to. He's the only one. So 
So let's be mindful of what he wants for us. Can we be mindful of what Christ wants for us? We can lay aside all of our stuff. We can lay aside all of our problems and and our circumstances and situations that are going on in our life and say, God, that will be done. I believe that we'll move through some of this faster and faster when we say, I will, Lord. I surrender all to you. So I believe God is asking us for a new commitment today to say that I'm going to be spiritually prepared for whatever come. He's asking us to raise the bar and be spiritually prepared for what's next. I would hate to see us be unprepared. You know what spiritual preparedness causes us to do? It causes us to hear him. It causes us to hear his voice so clearly. We serve a God that knows everything. I heard a prophecy the other day that says, uh, we're in the season of storing up things. It's a time for us to store up. See, now, whether that's truth or not, I don't know. But I do know that I can hear the voice of God. And so when you can hear the voice of God and and you understand what God is saying to you, you're going to always be prepared for what's to come. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to be frustrated about it. You don't have to worry about whether I need to store up or not. He'll tell you if you need to. He'll give you the wisdom if you need to. He'll let you discern the times and the season. But we got to be connected to the vine and able to hear what God has to say to us. Because if you're not connected, you're not going to be able to hear. And then you're going to be running over here, listening to somebody else's word. Somebody else's word may not be your word for the moment. It might not be what you need in this hour, in this time in your life. But he has something just for you. And what I like about him is his truth is always consistent. (laughs) It's always consistent. The Bible says he's the same today (laughs) as he was yesterday. He's the same God. The same God. Over 2,000 years ago, he's still the same God today. Today, he's the same God. So while we're standing in this room, I want us to make a commitment to be spiritually prepared. Amen. Can we do that this morning? How many of you want to be spiritually prepared? Lift those hands up real high. Let me see you. Let's make the commitment to be spiritually prepared. And commit to always learning. Always learning what God has to say. Always listening for his voice. Staying rooted and grounded in his scriptures, in his word. Come on, lift those hands one more time. We're going to pray to the Lord. And I believe this is for everybody. I don't care when you got saved. I don't care if you've been saved 50 years, 60 years, 20 years, two days. It's for all of us. To be spiritually prepared. Heavenly Father, you see these hands that are lifted up all over this building. And those that are at home that are lifting up their hands, Lord God. Father, we're saying that we desire to be spiritually prepared. We're making a commitment today to no longer just be surface, God. But we're 
making a commitment to go deeper. We're making a commitment to spend more time in your word. We're making a commitment to listen, to be still, to hear your voice. We're making a commitment to spend time with you. But God, we're making a commitment to prepare our hearts in this turbulent time. Oh God, so that we can be strong in the Lord. God, so that we can have the wisdom of God, that we can walk in discernment and we can walk in truth, Lord God, that we don't have to be deceived in this hour and this season, Lord, but we can walk in the truth and the revelation and the wisdom of God. So Father, we ask you today to help us. Oh God, help us. Help us, Lord. God, some of us, We've just been lazy, God. And then, God, we ask you to forgive us for the time we should have spent with you. Forgive us for the time that we should have been in your word. Forgive us for the time, God, that we should have been listening for your voice. Instead, we listen to the voice of another forgive us Lord and then Father I pray that there is a stirring in the hearts of your people in the days to come oh God I pray that there's a hunger and a thirst after the things of God that you'll become first place in our life again God that we'll prepare ourselves for what is next and then God will be careful to give you the glory and to give you the honor and give you the praise. Could you give him a shout of praise? Come on. God will give you the praise. This is what I like about the God that we serve. He will prepare us for what is next. He loved us enough to come into this room to say, get prepared. I need you to think about it that way. He loved you enough to come into a room and say, get prepared spiritually for what is to come. Why? Because he don't want you to be defeated. And he wants you to be able to be strong in the Lord. He loves us. Maybe you're in the room today and you say, well, Pastor Jackie, I have not even taken the first step. And that is to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to give you an opportunity, I believe, as well. That is an invitation for Christ. He desires for you to be a part of his family. He said in his word, he wished not one bit would be lost. Not one. Not one. That's God's wish. He says, I wish not one be lost. He says, not one. That is my desire. So that lets me know when the word comes to you, that's an invitation. That is an open door for you to become a part of God's family. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads in the room right now. If you're in the room and you said, Pastor Jackie, I, I, I need to make a decision for Jesus Christ. And you're making this decision for the very first time. Come on, lift your hands all over the room and then wave them at me so I can see you. Lift them up high. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe you're in the room and you're rededicating your life to Christ as well. I want those that are rededicating their life. Once you lift those hands real high, say, Pastor, I got to get it right. I'm coming back home. I'm coming back to the Lord. Come on, lift those hands. I see those hands. Thank you for lifting those hands. Hallelujah. Come on, I'm going to give you another few seconds. Don't be intimidated. But when God comes knocking at your door, open up the door and allow him to come into your heart. 
Come on one more time. If you're in the room, lift those hands real high. Thank you for those that have lifted their hands already. Lift your hands up before we pray. And if you're online, this invitation goes out to you as well. We want you to be a part of this. Amen. Come on, church, let's pray. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of all of my sins. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ. I believe that you are the risen Savior. Now I receive what you have done for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give him a big hand clap. Hallelujah. Come on, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. And if you're in the room, if you made a decision for Christ, there's a card in the seat back pocket of your chair. Would you get it out? It says, decide. Tell us that what happened to you today, whether you made a decision for Christ for the very first time or, or whether you rededicated your life to Christ. We want to know. We want to put some resources in your hands to help you grow in your relationship with Christ. Amen. Oh, it makes me so happy to see how many people are coming to Christ. Amen. This is the year of revival for us. This is a year, amen, for people to come to Christ, the year of the harvest. So we're believing that people are coming to Christ day in and day out. Y'all keep on praying. It's happening. It is happening in our house. Amen. I believe we're up to like 79 that I know personally that happened in this house. And I believe they said some. Somewhere up to 11 of our students went to camp and rededicated their life to Christ. Tell me God ain't working. And I believe that he's going to work in big numbers. And so we're trusting God to do it. But you have the responsibility to go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ. If you happen to pray for somebody on your job, they get saved. Call, call me and say, Pastor, somebody got saved on my job. I'll count that too, amen. I'm counting everything this year. <laughs> Hallelujah. But if you're in the house this morning and you came and you said, well, pastor, I have a prayer need, a prayer request. Come on, lift your hands up real high. We want to pray for you concerning that prayer need. Hallelujah. I see these needs that are in the room. Thank you, Jesus. Lift them up real high. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I know that these hands represent so many different needs, whether it's financial, whether it's physical, whether it has to do with a relational, whatever the need may be. Maybe you have something, a project that needs to be finished. I just want you to know that God is able. He is able. He's able to meet you at the point of your need. And so, Father, we're standing and we're praying. You told us to come boldly to the throne of grace. And, Father, so we're coming so that we can find favor in the presence of the Lord. Father, you see all these hands that are lifted up all over this building. Lord, I ask you, God, to meet each and every person at their point of their need, God. You know exactly what they stand in need of, God. Oh, God, lift up the hung down head. God, cause depression to fall off, Lord. The spirit of heaviness to fall to the ground in the mighty name of Jesus. God, we release the healing virtue power of the Holy Spirit to just flow in this place. Oh God, heal us physically, heal us emotionally, heal our broken hearts, Lord, heal our minds. Oh, bind up every wound in the name of Jesus. Encourage those, God, that need encouragement, bring strength in situations that seem hopeless. Lord, we stand and we ask you to show yourself strong and mighty on the behalf of your people, God. Whatever it is, Lord, you are able. You are able. You are able. We serve an able God. Bring restoration and healing in the mighty name of Jesus. Can we give him a big hand clap of praise? Would you praise him like it's done? Can you praise him like it's done? Come on.
praise him like it's done already. Woo. I believe, I don't know about you, but I believe he's in the room today. And he's going to meet you at the point of your need. Amen. We serve an awesome God. Give him a big hand cap of praise one more time. Come on.